Well, good afternoon if you are in New York City or Sarasota, Florida. Good evening if you are in Parma, Italy, or anywhere in Europe or Africa that may be following us. Good overnight to people in Asia and Oceania. Hello to the penguins in Antarctica. I know you're listening in. And greetings especially to our loved ones in Ukraine. Stay strong. Let music help you. We are with you. I'm Fred Plotkin. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Adagio, as you know, is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. Now, today we're devoting ourselves to one of my favorite topics, which is Giuseppe Verdi. Uh, regular vis- listeners have known that I always call him my hero. I'm not saying he's my favorite composer, but he's certainly among them. But he is my hero, not only among composers, but among people in general. So I'm very biased. And our reporter, let's call him that, from Planet Verdi, namely from Parma, is my friend Francesco Itzo. Francesco is a professor of music at the University of Southampton. He serves, and I love this title, as Direttore Scientifico, the scientific director of the Verdi Festival in Parma, where he is right now. And he's the general editor of the works of Giuseppe Verdi, which is an ongoing project that I'd like to talk to him about. And I made a note to myself, since 2023, just now, he's the program director of the Accademia Verdiano at the Teatro Reggio in Parma. So welcome, Francesco. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for this lovely introduction. I'm very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine. So let's start with the basics. I'm so glad to see you. Likewise. Um, Are you from Parma originally? I'm not, actually. Uh, Many people ask that uh, because I have a home in Parma and Parma feels like home as, uh, as a city. But I was born in Bologna and then I grew up in Rome. And then, as you know, I moved to the United States to to uh, to study musicology at New York University. And uh, that's where you and I met quite a few years ago. Yes. And now I live between England and Parma. So it's one of my homes, but I'm really not from here. Well, actually, since you mentioned New York University, um, there is an Institute of Verity Studies at NYU, right? Yes. Would you talk about what that is? Yes, it, it is a project that was established at New York University in the uh, mid-1970s uh, when there was an acute awareness that uh, uh, Verdi was becoming increasingly important, not only because his operas are so uh, popular and widely loved, but also as a subject of uh, investigation, of uh, scholarly research. And there was uh, this, this uh, acute awareness, as I was saying, that the source materials the manuscripts, the correspondence, the the, uh, the musical sources uh, were in Europe. And in those days, before the digital revolution, it was very difficult to access not only a, a Verdi autograph manuscript, but also the correspondence and uh, um, uh, indeed archival uh, documents, uh, even printed documents such as first editions of his librettos and scores. So this in- Institute was established to um, assemble a collection of materials on uh, a 35 millimeter microfilm, as one did in those days. Uh, It rapidly became uh, certainly the largest collection of Verdi materials in the world. The Institute was run uh, by Martin Chusit, professor at NYU, who was also my uh, PhD advisor. And so I I had the great uh, honor of working with him in that Institute of serving uh, as its archivist and then as associate director. Um, at, at present, the uh, the institute is mostly a um, a collection of materials, and clearly, with the digital revolution, its purposes are uh, have changed and are changing somewhat. But it is it remains a wonderful resource. So, as people say, I'm asking for a friend. If there were a New Yorker who happens to have an outstanding collection of books and documentation about Verity in his home. And he's trying to decide where they should be left in perpetuity. Where would you tell that New Yorker to donate them? I would certainly advise New York University as a very good place. But which it's not the department? only one. Which it's department? not the only one. 
Well, it would, it would be through the, the, through the main library at New York University, the Books okay. Library, and the music department in, uh, uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Science. Okay. Part of why I ask is that you and I have in, in common a very dear friend named Stefano Albertini, who studied at the University of Parma, and he's the director of the Casa Italiana Zidili Marimo, where I've led an opera course for many years. And you have joined me at that course, and you teach there, and it's a wonderful institution. Um, Stefano is not from Parma, but he went to the University of Parma and was recently honored as the alumnus of the year and has a very strong feeling for Parma. Um, from your perspective, talk about this institution that is the Casa Italiana Zidili Marimo and its presence in Florence. Goodness, um, it's it's hard to be objective because it is one of the places where I, where I where I grew up, I think, as a, as a, a music scholar and probably a little bit as a, as a human being. Uh, the, the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo is, as you know, the, the, the home of the Department of Italian Studies at New York University, but it is much more than that. It is a very lively, very active cultural organization uh, with an extraordinary program of um, uh, events, initiatives, lectures, conferences, concerts, uh, exhibitions, and it is really uh, an extraordinary uh, point of reference for anyone in the United States, but also elsewhere, frankly, uh, who has any interest in Italian culture. Uh, sadly, especially you know, since, uh, since the, the um, COVID crisis began, I haven't had as many opportunities as I used uh, to have to come to New York City, but I do read very carefully um, um, the, the, the mailings and the, the social media posts that come from Casa Italiana. And I never cease to be amazed at the, the incredible um, quantity and quality of the uh, activities they organize. It is such a wonderful, um, such a wonderful place. And perhaps ironically, but maybe not, there are things about Italian culture that I learn about just reading what the Casa Italiana is doing. So a, a, yeah. recent, a recently released film uh, or uh, a, an author, um, um, a novelist or a poet that in my great ignorance, I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's constantly enriching and eye-opening, even just to know what they do, uh, although I, I rarely get to be there in person. Uh, of course, the Casa Italiana is closely linked to New York University in Florence, uh, with which I have collaborated recently. I was there for a concert uh, with with some of my students from the Academia Verdiana just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that's another great place to to go to. So th there's a lot to be said for what NYU has done over the years uh, on on behalf of uh, Italian culture. What I want to add a little bit more about that is it was founded and funded by a very enlightened woman named she was a Baroness Baronessa Mariuccia Zerilli Marimo, who was a huge opera lover apart from everything else and went to Bayreuth and had a box at La Scala and had a home in Monte Carlo and went to the opera there. And I ran into her all over Europe. She was well into her 80s and still very active attending performances. And she had the foresight to understand that if you make it sort of an Italian cultural institute that attracted just people who might have been already interested in Italy or Italian-American, you were not spreading the diversity of Italy. And she wisely turned this institution and understood that Stefano was the one to lead it into an international center of Italian studies and culture. And um, my opera thing is part of it, but they commission composers and they do visual arts and cuisine. And Stefano knows a lot about, well, about all Italian films, about Dante, about Machiavelli. And the whole department has great depth in everything relating to Italy and not just the predictable things. And you and I tend to fit in there in the musical context. And I speak there about food on occasion. But um, about the pandemic, Stefano happened to have been in Italy when the pandemic hit in the winter of 2020. And it hit Italy, Lombardy, before it hit New York by about two weeks. And he remained in Italy for a very long time. And rather than shut down the cause, of, they did courses online, but he did an incredible amount of programming so that actually the Casa had more about Italian culture from Italy reported by the director of the Casa himself 
than any other institution I can think of when basically opera houses closed, everything closed. Stefano and Julian Sachs and other people on his team kept producing content for years that is now a very enriching part of understanding Italian culture where Stefano would take his phone and walk along a street and narrate a town, narrate the culture. And I think this is very important because people who are interested in Italy tend to be interested in the famous names, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Verdi, and others, Puccini, um, in the 10 big pasta dishes and pizza and, and things like that, but they don't go deeper. And this is what the documentation that the Baroness wanted, that most everything be recorded and available as content in a more modern way than microfiche and all of that. And so therefore, I want people to understand and go to the Casa Italiana Zidili Marimo website and also, of course, to discover everything about Planet Verity, which is why we're here today. Um, where do we begin? Well, I'm going to begin in the fact that you were born in Bologna. How long did you live in Bologna before being abducted to Rome? <laughs> only only eight years. I, I, uh, um, I was born in Bologna, which is a city where my father, um, uh, who was from Venice, met my mother, who was born in Bologna. And uh, then my father, who was a professor of sociology, um, uh, got a job at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. So the whole family mm -hmm. relocated. And again, I was, I was just a child, eight years old. I remained okay. uh, connected to Bologna through uh, my, uh, uh, my grandparents, uh, the last of whom passed away when I was 20, 21 years old. Um, so so then, then that link be became became less strong and then I moved to to America and from there to to the UK so things things change and was your mother a good bolognese cook eh. <laughs> 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 my mother my mother had many many gifts and talent talents and she was a wonderful mother and I miss her a lot um but uh cooking no it was not one of her strengths <laughs> um I I Sometimes I say uh, tongue in cheek that um, uh, passion for food that I have uh, is part of my uh, my um, um, rebellion uh, during my adolescence mm -hmm. uh, because because I was not introduced to, to to good food in in my family. So that's something that I kind of discovered myself little by little. I like to cook. I'm not great. I you know sometimes I see the things you cook, Fred, and and. Uh, I don't think I would ever find the courage of making a meal for you, but I, I can, I oh, can no, get no. about the kitchen and I have not learned from my mom. I've learned many other things from her. Okay. No, <laughs> I asked because, and this is really crucial, actually. Um, Bologna is the capital of the region of Emilia Romagna. And the Emilia part has an ancient road called the Via Emilia, which begins at or near Milan and goes to Piacenza, Parma, Modena, Reggio Emilia, Modena, Bologna, and then down to the Adriatic through Romagna. Um, there are many people who say that Parma is the greatest food city in Italy, the greatest food city in the world. Um, Parma is, has a magnificent food tradition. We often talk very seriously about Verdi and food and his relationship to food. He was a farmer. He wrote recipes. I have a Verdi cookbook of his recipes. Um, but I think Bologna is a better food city than Parma. And I love Parma. And I say this to all my Parma friends that I will visit with you and eat with you happily in your town. But Bologna to me is an infinitely, it's the greatest food city in Europe, I think. Not Paris, not Vienna, not Barcelona, not London. Uh, it's Bologna. And that's why I asked you about that. I went to the University of Bologna. And everything in my life changed when I learned to cook in Bologna. Mm-hmm. And I didn't go to cooking school. I just learned from people. And it everything about, I mean, Rossini knew Bologna and ordered his food from Bologna and Modena when he lived in Paris. And I mention this because in talking about the what the Italians called the realtà, the reality of uh, culture in Emilia Romagna, it's music. Renata Tibaldi, uh, Luciano Pavarotti, Morella Frani, Leonucci, 
um, Ruggiero Raimondi, many, 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 many artists, conductors, um, even if they were not from there, such as Ricardo Muti and, and Claudio Bado, they put down roots in Emilia Romagna because culturally it was great. But the awareness and sophistication that comes in food, and I don't mean fancy food, I mean deep, deep knowledge and a passion for knowledge about how an ingredient works, to me would be the same thing as how the wood in a musical instrument makes the particular sound. How Verdi would pick from what he had available to him, whether musical ingredients or whether food ingredients, to create something extraordinary. And it's something about the tradition of excellence in Emilia Romagna, even if people don't always get along on certain topics, but it doesn't matter, um, that really made it fertile territory for opera. Now, yes, certainly Lombardy and Veneto and, and Liguria and many regions, Naples, um, have a lot of fertile territory for opera, but there's just something particular about the environment of Parma for Verdi, of Bologna and Modena, all these towns, and the relationship to opera. You're having been born in Bologna, but raised in Rome, but now living in Parma. Would you reflect on the way you experience this attachment to excellence that is something I see in Emilia Romagna? Goodness. Um... What a great question. It's 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 hard to tell because you know having having changed homes several times in in my life, um, I have to admit I don't necessarily feel a particular attachment or sense of belonging in uh, in Emilia Romagna. So my my perception of this region is uh, um, that uh, uh, to a certain extent because of historical and political reasons. It is a region that uh, that developed and became more modern than other parts of Italy uh, quite quickly, uh, and uh, uh, Verdi lived long enough to witness the, 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 this this process of modernization. If you if you look at a piece like Fausta for Verdi's last opera, you know it, there is so much in it that is about modernity, um, um, and um, um, the idea of. Uh, of excellence in uh, in uh, Emilia Romagna, which is as you as you rightly say, there are many places in Italy and elsewhere which are also excellent. For me here, there is a great sense of uh, of efficiency, uh, of uh, uh, of making things work um, very very well. There is a great sense of community. Uh, it is a society that in in today's world really stands out for uh, for how cohesive it can be. Um, and um, um, for someone, I guess for someone, I'm really thinking in in real time, uh, and I'm I'm loving you know, doing this, being being uh, being led to, to 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 think about this great question. Um, opera is such a collaborative art form. It is probably the quintessential collaborative art form. No opera has ever or could ever come into existence through the work of only one person. Uh, there is you know, typically a composer and librettist, but there are then, then impresarios, uh, theater managers, there are censors, there are publishers, there are indeed singers and instrumentalists and conductors. And, and uh, uh, so the sense of being collaborative that, that sometimes you experience in Emilia Romagna certainly does feed into, into operates. And it's worth remembering that Verdi is the, is the, the, the great uh, Emiliano in the history of opera uh, because he was born uh, in in, in, uh, in near Buseto, uh, so in in, uh, um, in in an area that is now in the province of Parma, but near Piacenza and near the Po. Um, but think about Donizetti and about Rossini, who studied at the Liceo Musicale in Bologna. In terms of their and training, Mozart. they and before them, of course, Mozart as a child, yeah. as a, as a, as a small child. Uh, went went to the, the, the to, to, to Bologna and took took a counterpoint test to, to be admitted and the manuscript of that can still be seen in the library of the of the Accademia Filarmonica in Bologna. So there is a lot of history uh, in uh, uh, in that regard and it's fascinating to think about it. Um, I always and not just I, everyone unfortunately seems to leave out of town when we talk about Emilia Romagna, and that town is Reggio Emilia. 
And Reggio Emilia sits between Parma and Modena. And people talk about Modena for Pavarotti, for Freni, for Accetto Balsamico Tradizionale, for sports cars, for wealth. People talk about Parma for elegance and sophistication and Verdi and so on. But right in the middle is Reggio Emilia. And Reggio Emilia is important in the world for a few things. Um, one of them is it's considered to have the best early childhood education system in the world. And it's the model that everyone goes to study for how to start children off in life in a way that makes them cultured, polite, educated, um, sociable and societal, if that's a word. And it's a city that just goes its own way and is kind of ignored for the most part, but it has the best of the whole region, but without calling attention to itself, it too has a wonderful opera house. Um, many people think that Luciano Pavarotti made his opera debut in Modena. He didn't. He made it in Reggio Emilia in La Boheme in 1961, I believe, January 1961. And um, so therefore, there is that too. And this goes so deep in the region that this concept of early childhood and social benefit is something I find very particular to the region. Um, and I think that Verdi, I think he was infused with that concept of social benefit. Um, would you talk about the hospital that he built? I'm always fascinated by the story. I don't mean the Casa di Riposo in Milan, but the hospital in Emilia Romagna. Well, you know, about I, it? you know, it's it's hard to talk about it without being be, without being moved. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, and you yourself have, have looked at, at a bigger picture, um, uh, which which is that Verdi, in a very modern way, we were speaking about modernity a few moments ago, had a sense of uh, of the privilege that he had, uh, the, the great fortune that he had had, of course, which which he deserved because because he was a, br a brilliant artist, a brilliant composer, a brilliant mind. Uh, but he was aware that there were many who were not as fortunate as he had been, and and that there was a way of um, a very pragmatic way. He was very much a pragmatic man uh, of helping out. And so you know, today we we we. Um, uh, witness, especially in in the Western Hemisphere, in in the United States, that there there are um, uh, philanthropists and and uh, donors who have you know great giving capacity, and uh, they help build hospitals, and those hospitals are are named after them. Uh, and in Verdi, we have a, a wonderful late nineteenth century uh, uh, example of someone building a hospital, and then someone funding a, a the, the establishment of a care home. Uh, for um, aging musicians in Milan. Uh, so this, this sense of philanthropy is absolutely extraordinary. And uncommon. Um, I mean, what I meant specifically was that we know more about the Casa di Riposo in Milan, the rest home for retired musicians, which he called his greatest opera, his greatest work. But I was always very impressed by the fact that Verdi, whose parents had a farm, who, in addition to composing great operas and leading a political revolution, was also a farmer. And he saw farm workers die because at the time, and we, you and I know this, but we have to say this to other people, Italy was not Italy the way we know it when Verdi mm -hmm. was a young man. And there was the province of Parma and the province of Cremona. Cremona, if I remember correctly, was under Austria whereas Parma was under France or French control. And the workers who were on nearby plantations and farms where Verdi lived had to cross the Po River to try to get medical assistance on the north side of the river because they couldn't get it on the south side of the river. And they died, some of them. And Verdi was indignant over this. So he funded a hospital, if I'm correct, with money from the middle trilogy, which is to say... Rigoletto, Trovatore, and Traviata, and brought in doctors from Bologna and experts from Milan and created this hospital where anyone who had a medical need could go to the hospital and re receive free care, which this is before Germany, before Scandinavia, many, 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 many years before America, where we still don't quite do that. Uh, the national health in Britain is now 75 years old. But Verdi did this 
150 years ago, just yeah. out of I, his belief system. This is one of the reasons he's my hero. His belief system that everybody should have access to care and medical assistance and a decent life. And in your study of Verdi, what do you think animated this feeling in him that people beyond himself deserve decency and care and support and, and tranquility? Um, so the, 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 there are you know, quite, quite a few factors, first, first of all. Uh, he had a very clear sense of that uh, that is, there is no such a thing as a self-made person. Uh, um, I think that that he was, you know, very aware that he had been lucky to meet certain people. You know, starting from uh, his his you know, first great patron Barezzi uh, uh, in Museto, and of course his teacher, his music teacher there, Ferdinando Trovesi, and then Lavinia uh, in Milan. That he had you know, a sense of having been. Uh, um, well supported and that he would not have been there without that support. Um, and uh, he also had a, a, a very acute, very, very, very keen sense of uh, the um, inequalities and the injustice in, uh, in society at all levels. So, you know, think of, uh, of uh, um, the response that, that, uh, that he was met with when uh, he went to Buseto with Giuseppina Streponi, with whom they weren't married at the time. And uh, the, 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 they certainly didn't receive a warm welcome from, uh, from the, the, the fellow citizens of, uh, of Buseto. And Verdi responded very angrily to that and continued to dislike Buseto, actually, uh, for the rest of his life. He loved Sant'Agata, but he did not love Buseto. Uh, and the Buseto well, you say Sant'Agata was his farm that. very close to Buseto. Yes, yeah, absolutely, very close to Buseto, but but not uh, not the same thing. Uh, so uh, uh, all of this is to say, I guess, that one a key uh, aspect of Verdi's personality, which is very much reflected in his art, is empathy. Uh, Verdi you know, once wrote that when he thought about the characters of his operas, he cried, and uh, there is a lot to be said for someone who can cry about fiction. Well, there are people who cry about fiction, but then not about anything else. And Verdi did not belong in that category. Rather, rather Verdi had a sense of human suffering, uh, a sense, again, of human um, injustice and, and inequality. And, uh, and he tried his best to do something about it. So the, 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 the hospitale, the, the hospital that he uh, funded uh, 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 in, in, uh, in Villanova d'Arda, or Villanova Sularda, I don't remember the, the preposition, but uh, but uh, uh, it was built to serve an area which was which lacked um, uh, proper healthcare because it was in, in, in the middle of uh, of uh, very agricultural uh, part of uh, of Italy, but but too far from uh, from Milan or other big big cities for people to receive proper medical care. Um, so that is that is really again very moving, and and uh, I guess it, that it is uh, important not only as a fact of of uh, as a biographical um, um, a detail, but because it tells us a lot about who Verdi was uh, as a person and how how that then fed into into his creativity. Where do you think he acquired the sense of I'll call it injustice or the sense of justice? Um, was it in his early childhood reading, because he was quite a reader as a small boy? Was it, I mean, I don't know. He lived completely out in the country. He was not, he didn't grow up in Lucca or Bergamo or Pesaro like a lot of other Italian composers or Venice or Cremona. He really, until he was 13, he really lived on the farm and read and studied and yes, was a genius. But what happened? that gave him a sense of justice in a way that perhaps Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, Puccini, and others just never had? Gosh, I'll try to give you two quick answers. One is, uh, well, I don't want to say psychoanalytical, but it has to do with his early childhood. And there is the famous story of when he was mistreated by, by, uh, by a priest, uh, and he was, he was hit, and then, and then he felt that he didn't deserve that. And then he turned around and, and uh, said to the priest something like, you know, may God strike you down or whatever the words were. And then and then uh, a thunderbolt actually struck the church uh, a few <laughs> weeks later. 
uh, so the, the, the was this San Michele Arcangelo? The, that yeah, that's 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 okay. right, and yep. uh, uh, and uh, um, so there is the, 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 this this sense of right and wrong somehow is is deeply rooted in his early childhood. And then there is the 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 answer of someone who is both an educator um, like yourself and the the son of a sociologist, as I think I mentioned previously. Uh, he met a lot of really really good people, you know, ranging from uh, from Provesi and around whom the Società Filarmonica in Buseto uh, revolved, and uh, uh, then uh, his teachers in Milan, and, and uh, then he, as a, as, a, as a rising star in the world of, of music and opera, he was admitted to the, 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 um, the salons of, uh, of Milanese uh, nobility and aristocracy, which meant uh, intellectuals uh, at, at, at the time. So there's a lot uh, of, of stuff going on and it is, I don't think it's possible to pinpoint one uh, specific or, or even one individual reason for Verdi being the way he was. There are also things that he overstated himself late in life you know, when, when he uh, um, wrote um, uh, some you know, sort of memoirs that were appended to the, the biography written by Arthur Poujan. Uh, and one of the things that he said, uh, mm, not just in that, um, um, in those biographical remarks, but also in his letters is, for example, Shakespeare, you know, I've been reading um, uh, Shakespeare from my earliest youth. That ain't true. That's, that's uh, simply not true because Shakespeare was not available uh, in, in Italy, uh, except for you know, some, some vague adaptations. But it was really with the publication of, uh, of, uh, um, um, uh, of translations in, in the late 1830s, by which time Verdi was in his 20s. It, it is at that point that Shakespeare becomes accessible. In, in Italy and that he, he reads it. But certainly he was a great reader. He loved reading, he loved literature, he loved theater. Uh, and uh, uh, and all of this, of course, goes into, into the person he really was. I also think that he was affected positively by his numerous long stays in Paris and by the social life and debates and contrast in Paris to what he knew in Italy in terms of public discourse and ideas and the role of art. And I'm not saying that he imitated that, but I think that he reacted to that. You're so that right. You're so right, Fred, absolutely. Uh, I, you're, I'm so glad you're pointing this out uh, because it is a fundamental aspect of, of uh, Verdi. Uh, in Italy and in this part of Italy for very um, obvious reasons, which 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 I share as an Italian, we are proud of Verdi as an icon of Italian uh, culture. Uh, but the reality, to me, is that Verdi was much more than an Italian. He was certainly a European and a citizen of the world in many ways, and and he was was very open to to uh, the cosmopolitanism of Paris. When Verdi arrived in Paris in 1847. Uh, on the way to London, where he was to compose and, and uh, supervise the premiere performance of Imaz Nadieri, uh, he reconnected with Giuseppina Streponi, whom she, he had met a few years prior in, in Milan. Um, but he also received, received a commission from the, the Opera in, in Paris, from the Académie Royale de Musique. Uh, and that commission resulted in Jerusalem, his first French work of later in 1847. Starting around that time, if you look at the following decade, you realize that Verdi spent more time in Paris than in Italy. So not only because he was working there, uh, for example, uh, composing uh, Le Vêpre Sicilienne, uh, the Sicilian Vespers, and then preparing the, the French uh, revision of Il Trovatore as Le Trouver, but really because he was happy in Paris and he found the, the, the open-mindedness and the cultural stimuli, which uh, weren't uh, really uh, as widely available in uh, uh, in Italy, even in a city like Milan. Have you ever walked Verdi's Paris? I did this once. I took a week. I studied up on where he lived, Rue Richelieu, where he went, the theater that he worked in, because it was not the, quote, Paris opera that we think of now. But there was in the uh, Palais Royal, there was a theater, and, and the Comédie Française was there. And his orientation was more for people who know Paris, the Palais Royal, the area just north of the Louvre, in I guess this is the second arrondissement, I'm not certain, 
um, rather than the opera that we think of now, which is 1875. But um, he would have known the Teatro des Italiens. Rossini would have told him where to go in Paris. And it's fascinating because I, I understand when I read him and think about him that he was very influenced by Parisian mores. La Traviata is a direct outgrowth of that. His preference for French wine over Italian wine, even though he preferred Italian food. So he early on was pairing French wine with Italian food, which people still don't do. But in his mind, it worked better. And yeah, I never absolutely. begrudge him that. But, you know, he was a big collector of French wine. And, you know, Rossini drank whatever you put in front of him. <laughs> but, Verdi was, <laughs> but Verdi was very, very particular about that. Um, I think there's a lot to be done about Verdi in Paris. So that's your next job. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, a, there's a lot of work that, that, that to be done. There's a lot of really wonderful work that, that is being done or that has been done recently. A young Italian scholar by the name of Ruben Vernazza has written a book specifically about Verdi and the Teatro Italien, oh, where okay. many of his operas were, were performed in Italian, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, some of them uh, in, uh, in Verdi's presence. And uh, um, in uh, the area of, uh, of uh, critical edition, which I now supervise, uh, the, the works of Giuseppe Verdi, we've started um, doing work. The next volume we're going to publish is Le Trouvert, which is, as I mentioned. So the, before the we get to critical edition, because yeah. this is going to be a big part of our conversation, I had one more question that you inspired before. I don't know if there's a right answer. And when I talk to people who are authoritative, such as yourself, they all have their opinions and I'm interested in their opinions. Was Verdi an atheist? Was Verdi an agnostic? Was he in some way religious? Was he clerical? Was he anti-clerical? Was he all of the above? Where do you stand on Verdi and his relationship to religion? Um Verdi lived a very long life, and and uh, and uh, as as a very intelligent man, he changed his mind about things. His attitude towards religion was always critical, not in the sense of of an overt hostility or disbelief or atheism, but in the sense of questioning things, because that's what he did in life. Uh, and uh, uh, was he anti-clerical? He certainly was during the eighteen sixties. That is a very important phase in the in the history of Italy. You know that better than I do, Fred. But but just to to, to offer our listeners a, a brief summary, the uh, unification of Italy was a long and painstaking process, which you know took up um, uh, uh, most of the middle part of the 19th century. Uh, and a pivotal moment was uh, the Second War of Italian Independence in 1859, which led to, to, to the, 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 the defeat and the withdrawal of the Austrians from most of Northern Italy, and then the establishment of the Kingdom of Italy around the kernel of Piedmont of the Kingdom of Sardinia in 1861. But Rome and the Papal States, uh, I should say, were, were excluded from that process and uh, uh, Pope Pius IX um, um, re remained in, in charge of, of political power in, in central Italy. And if you look at what Verdi does during that phase of, uh, of his creativity, you have the wonderful, wonderful character of Padre Guardiano, who is a little bit of a Fra Cristoforo from, from Manzoni's um, um, I Promessi Sposi, and uh, that that is a positive uh, uh, a positive monk uh, figure, but then there is Melitone, the, the comic figure in in, uh, mm -hmm. in the same opera La Forza del Destino, who, who is you know, petty and and mean. Um, uh, and then uh, look at what happens in Don Carlos, uh, where where uh, let's do dates. Uh, Forza was eighteen sixty two. Don Carlos eighteen sixty seven. That's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, you for, okay. for, thank you for filling in the blanks so efficiently. And then look at the priests in Aida. Of course, yeah. Aida is a story set in, in ancient Egypt, uh, but does it really matter all that much when it comes to the depiction of the clergy who are so incredibly powerful that even the daughter of, of the king uh, can't do anything to stop an unjust execution, which has been ordered by, by, uh, by the chief priest? Uh, so there is a, there is a lot in that 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 speaks about Verdi's uh, stance toward 
institutionalized religion. But as, 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 as we know, faith and spirituality are very, are much broader and very different concepts. And uh, you know there is there is that moving letter where he leaves instructions for his own funeral. He says, "One priest, one candle, one cross." Um, so it, that that tells you that that uh, certainly he had you know so, so some some belief and some empathy with some of the values of Christianity. Did it matter to him that it was a Christian religion and not another religion? I don't think that it matters or that it mattered all that much. But a sense of spirituality uh, is certainly there, and you experience it in practically every single opera that he composed, because uh, because you have prayers everywhere, and yeah. even even in Falstaff you have you have uh, that delightful amen sung sung as a, as a as a canon. Of course, it's it's a funny moment. It's 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 comedy, uh, but uh, but religion is there even in uh, uh, in um, uh, in Falstaff. So. More since you raise wonderful things, I'm going to go further. Um, Aida, Egypt, 1871, Milan, 1872. The, he then basically thought he was going to stop composing opera. But soon after that, with the death of Manzoni, he wrote the Messa that Equium, the Requiem Mass that came out in 1874, if I remember. And that is a religious work, but not only. You are doing that as part of the Verdi Festival this year in Parma. Talk about the religious or non-religious elements of that work in the Verdi repertoire. I think Francesco is zoomed frozen. There you are. Okay, you're blinking. <laughs> Did you hear my question? Yeah, I'm really sorry. The, 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 okay. the internet connection connection froze. It's probably my, my problem. My, my connection at home is not, not ideal. Okay. Uh, but here we are again, and uh, what I uh, what I heard was was about Aida, 1871, 1872, Il Cairo okay. and Mascala. Then, then okay, I lost. Then what I was asking, asking was kind of, then came the Requiem, and yeah. the Requiem could be viewed certainly as a religious piece, but maybe not. Um, it was premiered in a church, but then brought to La Scala to an opera house, and has been performed both ways ever since. Um, does that re reflect Verdi's religiosity or does it reflect a particular feeling for the writer Alessandro Manzoni? I think both. I think both. Certainly the occasion is very important. Verdi had this very strong sense of debt to, uh, to other intellectuals, uh, uh, people of culture uh, who, who came before him and who really had an impact on what he did. Uh, the Mesa de Requiem, let's not forget the, 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 the kernel, uh, the, 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 the initial impulse for a Mesa de Requiem comes after Rossini's death in, uh, in 1868. Rossini plans a collective musical homage uh, in, mem in memory of Rossini, and that is a mass composed by, by several composers, including Verdi himself, who provided the Liberame. That project never came to fruition. It was supposed to be premiered in 1869. Verdi kept the Liberame, and around that Liberame, then he built the Manzoni uh, Requiem. And I, I think that, that the spiritual value of that is, is uh, very difficult to question. Um, but uh, but also the fact of of honoring the, the memory of one of of, uh, uh, of Italy's greatest um, poets and uh, novelists uh, is is extremely important. Would the requiem have existed in the same form without Manzoni? Probably not. But it is at the same time something that that goes beyond Manzoni. Two more questions came to me out of your comments about Verdi and religion. Uh, and the first one is not a joking question. It's serious. Um, in La Forza del Destino, there's a scene that in effect is a public food shelter, a food kitchen for the poor, where they're serving food and giving food to the masses, so to speak. And that always struck me. It's a scene that's somewhat comical as Bellatone feels he's overwhelmed by the demand of, for food. But there's something very central there that and, and yes, the opera premiered in St. Petersburg and not Italy, but the sense that the the poor need to be fed is always a very moving scene to me that people ignore when they talk about that opera because it's comical. What are your feelings about that scene and why Verdi created it as he did? 
Um, I do find it very moving. First of all, you know, La Forza del Destino is one of the operas we did at the last festival we had the last year uh, in a wonderful production directed by by um, uh, Konstantin Kokos. And uh, uh, it, it is, you know, very powerful when you see something uh, something like that, when you see that there are people who are poor, who are living in the aftermath of war, uh, it is very, it, it resonates with current concerns uh, around the world, needless to say. Uh, Forza is a very peculiar opera. It is an epic um, um, a story that, that unfolds uh, over Spain and Italy at, at uh, over several years. In that regard, it, it, you can compare it to uh, a much earlier work, I Lombardi alla prima crociata. Um, so, and, and it, it is probably the, 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 the pinnacle of uh, Verdi's conscious effort to blend different genres and, and uh, uh, different modes of expression in, in his operas. Uh, you have comic uh, characters or characters who speak in in the language of comic opera, um, uh, starting in uh, uh, in the mid to late 1840s. I mean, even the witches in Macbeth have a comic side to them when you look at how they're they're depicted musically. And then, if you if you move forward and you go to Rigoletto and the the the, the, the Cortigiani, uh, or you know some moments in the party scenes of uh, of La Traviata. Um, you realize, you know, how much interest Verdi has in in uh, in what what the great scholar Piero Weiss uh, called the fusion of genres. And when you get to La Forza del Destino, which is based on a very uh, uh, unique literary source, a play um, uh, called Don Alvaro or La Fuerza del Sino by, by the Duque de Rivas, uh, you have it right there. You know, th th this contrast between different levels. Uh, rather than having dramatic concentration and 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 utter tragedy, you have these different uh, different moments. But but uh, it's it's amazing how a seemingly comic scene, because it has Militone at the center of it, it really still makes us reflect about the human the human condition. And to go back to what we were discussing earlier, uh, Verdi's desire to help when he could. Now, the second question, and I'm sure we can speak about Verdi and religion for hours, but um, I feel the opera that of his that is the most challenging to present now, and it has nothing to do with Verdi, is Otello. And it has that has more to do with our mores and values right now. And I'm not saying they're good or bad or whatever, but... Um, it's a very fraught situation because it's about religion, it's about color, about race. Um, it's based on a Shakespeare play, Othello, of course. So Verdi first, we have to understand, drew from that. He basically cut out the first act of Shakespeare and telescoped and focused it with uh, Boito, the librettist, very well. But at its core is the fact that um, Il Moro, the Moor, in other words, someone from Morocco, from North Africa, from the Maghreb, um, this noble figure of Othello, Othello, is uh, married to a woman who's a Christian from Venice. She's a Catholic from Venice. So it's an interracial marriage. It may be an interreligious marriage. Uh, some people say that Othello has converted to Christianity. Um, I'm not certain about that. I, I see enough sources that say one thing or the other. Um, but when in the last act of the opera, Desdemona, Desdemona prays, it's a completely Catholic religious prayer. Ave Maria Pieno di Grazia. Given that in our world nowadays, where there is religious strife all over the place and there are different religions, some people who are attacking one another all the time, unfortunately, and where within religions there is strife within Judaism, within Christianity, within Islam, all of them. Um, how, to whom do we have to be faithful when we present an opera like Otello? To Verdi, to the text, to Verdi's time, or do we try to, I mean, there's the whole issue of makeup and, and whether Othello is black, brown, Moorish, whatever color we want to give him, or should he be white if 
if the singer is white or Chinese if the singer is Chinese. Um, what are your feelings about this, but religion being at the core rather than race of my question? Um, thank you. That That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, and uh, um, I guess that that the, the, your question, I, I read it from two different perspectives. One is what is Otello really about? Um, is it is it? I think that it is in part about faith. Um, let's remember that the Ave Maria is a, is a very uh, very famous moment and certainly one of the most pr famous prayers in in the history of all of opera. Uh, but Otello pretty much begins with prayer, with the chorus. Uh, on uh, uh, on the shore, you know, looking at at the stormy sea and and um, looking at uh, Otello's vessel, which which is you know threatens to crash uh, into the rocks. Um, uh, so so th there is this this sense of witnessing events that we're not able to control, and uh, that that therefore give rise to 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 uh, acts of devotion, such as praying. To God in, in the case of the chorus at the beginning of the opera, uh, to to the Virgin Mary in the case of uh, um, of um, um, Desdemona in, in the final scene uh, of the opera, just before she is uh, she is uh, uh, murdered, and uh, there is so much going on. And inevitably, when we perform Otello nowadays, we need to make decisions. I say we, and I guess that I'm speaking, trying to put myself in. Uh, in the place of a stage director, for example, you know how pious is this demona? Do, do we look at her as a as a woman who prays all the time? Is this some sort of a performative moment? Does does, does she believe in it herself? Is it something uh, mechanical? At least in the beginning of the prayer, which is all on one note. After all, you know, it doesn't have much much movement melodically. So. Um, I'm so glad I don't have to do Otello right now because, because I I would have to think about this a long while. Um, I, I I think that you know your question articulates a very very uh, significant uh, problem. Um, the fact that you 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 said less, you know we don't need to to concentrate about the, on, on the racial theme right now, but you raise the point that I find intriguing that we don't really know of Otello's own religion. Uh, he commits suicide very, very deliberately at the end, very much like Don Alvaro in the, in the first version of La Forza del Destino. Then that changes, and uh, and we, we have a more pious ending for La Forza del Destino in the 1869 revision, which is the one we typically perform today. For Otello, there is no no such redemption. There is no expiation. That that that, that there is self inflicted death. Uh, and does that tell us something about his own uh, set of spiritual or uh, religious values? I'm not sure, but I'd like I'd like to well just just because because Otello is such a complicated theme, uh, I'd like to drift away from it for a moment. Then we can return to it and think about another opera, Il Lombardia la prima crociata. I mention it partly because it is on the program of this year's festival Verdi. That other opera, Il Lombardia la prima crociata, also has a love story uh, between a woman who is Christian, actually the daughter of, uh, of the leader of the Lombard Crusaders in, in the Holy Land, and um, a Muslim man, the mm -hmm. son of the, of the tyrant in, in Antioch. Uh, and, and that is a very, very powerful story, in some ways even more powerful than, uh, than Otello, if you, will, uh, if you will allow me, for the interreligious implications uh, of uh, um, of again a Christian woman and a Muslim man uh, um, loving each other, he then converts uh, and receives baptism just before dying in her arms. Uh, but but he is a Muslim, and uh, uh, and interesting. This would be the eleventh century. Sorry to interrupt. This is the eleventh century, if I recall. That's right. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and um, uh, Giselda in Il Lombardi la prima crociata is the first female character in an opera by Verdi who sings an Ave Maria. We're yeah. talking about you know more than forty years before Otello the opera, and there she is you know praying to the Virgin Mary, 
um, um, very much like like uh, um, this Desdemona does uh, in Otello. Um, I think that at some point you and I need to sit down in front of an audience, either in New York or Italy, either in English or Italian, and talk about Verdi and religion. Absolutely, I would love that. And how it's reflected in these operas, because it's much more diverse. I mean, there's Tefalia, which is about a Protestant. Oh, yes. And that's a whole other story than all of the others and, and mm -hmm. how he was attracted to that story for particular reasons. But I'm going to move on from that now. Um, we were talking about you being the general editor of what's called the works of Giuseppe Verdi, WGV for abbreviation, which is the University of Chicago Press and Casa Ricordi. Casa Ricordi, Verdi's publisher of most of his works based in Milan. University of Chicago, because of the late Philip Gossett, who was quite the musical scholar, very competitive, I will say, but he was also a remarkable scholar. And um, he was a trailblazer in documenting a lot of Italian opera, Rossini, which he worked on with Alberto Zeta, Donizetti, and Verdi. How did you come to be involved in the this arc, this critical edition program, let's call it that. And then we'll talk about what is a critical edition. Yes. Well, initially I owe it to, to Martin Chusid, uh, mm -hmm. my, my advisor whom we mentioned earlier, uh, who was the editor of the first critical edition ever of a Verdi opera, Rigoletto, which inaugurated the, the works of Giuseppe Verdi, the critical edition of Verdi's works. So through Chusit's teachings at New York University, I was introduced to the importance of approaching Italian opera with the rigorous uh, um, uh, awareness of the source materials of, of how we were, we were getting to know the music and the words for that matter of uh, Verdi's works. Um, uh, and it was Martin who in, um, encouraged me to study Verdi's second opera, Un Giorno di Regno. And so I went to Milan to look at the autograph score. I uh, realized at that stage that the opera contained some music that no one had really noticed before, or if they had noticed, they hadn't talked about it. So I did. And uh, um, and Philip Gossett, who was on my, on my uh, PhD dissertation committee, um, decided that it was a good idea for me to do the critical edition of Un Giorno di Regno. Then when his health uh, began to decline, um, uh, he approached me asking me whether I would be available to, to have a conversation about continuing uh, the project that he had directed himself for over 30 years. And in uh, 2014, I was appointed uh, general editor of this series. Now, um, you may have noticed when I began my introduction to our conversation today that I greeted people in Sarasota, Florida. Why did I do that? <laughs> oh, you did that because Sarasota Opera is is a um, uh, wonderful opera company and and the, um, uh, the first in the world that 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 ever performed every note that Verdi ever wrote. So we're not just talking about performing all of Verdi's operas, but we're talking about performing the different versions of all of Verdi's operas, including Don Carlos in five acts in French, including uh, the, the 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 two different versions of Macbeth and the two different versions of Simon Bocanegra. And I could go on and on and on. They also performed music, including fragments in, in concerts. Uh, and uh, the, the music director at Sarasota Opera, um, Victor De Renzi, is a strong believer in performing Verdi starting from reliable authoritative editions. Hence, he's always been a great supporter of the Verdi critical edition. And my own edition of Un Giorno di Regno, when it saw the light of day, uh, was had its world premiere performance at Sarasota Opera. I know that. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Sarasota, which is a lot more than palm trees and grapefruit. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> wonderful place. I, I love visiting Sarasota. It's a wonderful place for the arts and has one of the great opera companies in the United States. Um, now, I've only worked on one critical edition in my life, and it was under the supervision of Alberto Zeda, and it was in Pesaro, and it was a Rossini opera, Il Turco in Italia. And it's not that I created the edition, he did, but he let me watch and learn. And creating a critical edition is about a whole series of choices that the person creating the edition makes. And some of Verdi's operas might be more straightforward in terms of a critical edition. 
I'm guessing La Traviata. I'm guessing Falstaff. And then there are many that are profoundly complicated, like Macbeth, La Forza del Destino, um, Un Balo en Mascara, uh, Simone Bocanegra, quite a few, where there's Don Carlo above all, where there are so many directions that you can go in and creating a critical edition. How, how do you start it? What assumptions do you make? What research do you have to do? And what and I'll just throw one thing in for the audience to think about, too. Verdi may have written an aria in a particular way, but if a tenor or a soprano comes along and interpolates other notes, sometimes that becomes what's called performance practice, where Verdi wrote it come scritto, and Ricardo Muti may say, you have to do it the way Verdi wrote it, but other singers and other conductors might say, no, do it the way it works for you. Where do you, as the creator of the critical edition, come to make all these decisions? How do you make them? And do people follow what you do? <laughs> or do they ignore it? <laughs> this is this is another one, and this is another one where we need to get together and have a, a whole conversation <laughs> just about, uh, about this. Um, let me begin with something that Verdi wrote, because, uh, because it's, it's a very good entry point into critical editions. In 1855, if I remember correctly, Verdi wrote an angry letter to his publisher, to Ricordi, in Milan, uh, in which he basically said uh, that he was very unhappy about the latest editions of, uh, uh, of his operas. And he said, they're prepared with such little care and they're filled with an infinite number of errors. Um, this has to do with the fact that Verdi prepared his, uh, his scores in, in, uh, in manuscript on, on music paper. Uh, he um, then handed them over to copyists so that the vocal parts could be prepared and the singers could begin to uh, memorize uh, their, their, uh, their music. And in the meantime, he completed the orchestration. So this was a multi-layered uh, process. Um, and even the early editions of Verdi's operas were sometimes prepared while this process was not uh, was not complete, while, while this process was still ongoing, uh, so the the the, the forms, the, the the methods of production of opera at the same time led to mistakes, and Verdi was never happy about those mistakes. Even though he was pragmatic, he remained focused on the operas that he was working on. He wouldn't retrace his footsteps and go and correct things after the fact. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that over the years and actually centuries, we have studied Verdi's music, just like the music of other composers of Italian opera and other, other uh, countries and other genres, based on source materials that are faulty. Um, um, scores where the, the word alargando is mistaken for allegro, which is the exact opposite mm -hmm. in a way. Um, scores where a forte is mistaken for, for a piano. Scores where the words are the ones that the censors imposed and not the ones that Verdi and his librettists had uh, intended to use. And I could go on and on. So uh, um, starting from this state of affairs depicted by the angry Verdi in 1855, a critical edition starts from, in the case of Verdi, almost invariably his autograph scores, which are then compared to a variety of materials, uh, including printed scores, including printed librettos, including manuscript librettos, including different drafts of the same piece. Uh, and uh, um, the, the, the objective is to prepare a text that is as close as possible to the author's intention. As you indicated, uh, that intention is sometimes very straightforward, sometimes less so. Uh, and sometimes there are different stages in the creation of an opera. Let's take a simple one. I think that you mentioned it uh, rightly as a simple case, a relatively simple case, La Traviata. Verdi composed La Traviata. It received its premiere at the, the uh, uh, Opera House in Venice, La Fenice, in March of 1853, and it was not successful. Uh, Verdi was unhappy about the cast, among other things, but he was also not entirely happy about the score. Uh, and the, the evidence for that is that he withdrew the opera. He made a number of changes to the music, uh, recasting in particular the duet for Violetta and Germain in act two, but there are other changes as well. The opera was then introduced again to the audience the following year in 1854. It became quite rapidly very successful. And the version we rightly perform nowadays is the 1854 uh, version of La Traviata. What does the critical edition do? It provides the final text of La Traviata, therefore the 1854 version. I think that that's a fairly straightforward decision, but if you look at the critical edition of La Traviata, it contains an appendix or a series of appendices where you find 
the music of the, the those numbers that were different in 1853. So you're able to perform that music as well. You can study it for one thing, and you can also perform it uh, by replacing the, the, the numbers that we had the updated in uh, 54, or what I advise typically when, when I have any, any say on the matter, you perform the opera as Verdi left it in, in a form that he regarded as final, but then you, you have the opportunity to do, for example, a concert or a lecture recital where you allow people to hear the, 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 the earlier versions. So you get a wonderful uh, insight into Verdi's creativity and how he changed his mind about things. Uh, and that is a simple case. In uh, in the case of other operas that were works in progress on on, on uh, in various ways, it can become a lot more complicated. But but the objective is typically twofold. One is to provide one text which we regard as the main one, as the final version uh, of the opera, uh, or the one that was that was performed under the composer's supervision, and then provide ancillary materials. Uh, often appendices, sometimes small musical examples, if it is just a, a melodic detail, um, so that the performers can make choices. Mm -hmm. In a way, you were saying that the editor makes choices, and that's absolutely true. Uh, those are preliminary choices, but a good critical edition actually is one that not only makes its own preliminary choices, choices but one that empowers the performers singers, conductors, stage directors, to make their own choices on the basis of information that is as thorough and as reliable as possible. That is what a critical edition tries to do. When I worked with James Levine, he had a very strong policy, not only about Verdi, but all composers, that it was his responsibility, James Levine's as a conductor and as the artistic director of the Met, to do the final version of a piece of music of an opera that the composer knew. So whether that was Beethoven's Fidelio, the way Beethoven wrote it, not the way Mahler and Bernstein amended it, um, any of the operas, he did it in their, quote, final form from Levine's point of view. I agreed with him mostly on that, not always. There were things that I would have left in from certain works that I felt were very valid and represented the creative energy of a composer, Verdi, Wagner, whomever, um, Berlioz particularly, but also often Bach in a very particular way. Um, do you have any strong feelings about final versions versus intermediate versions as the ones to perform? Um, yes. Um... I have a strong feeling, but it is a general feeling, and it coincides with, with Levine. A final version has a lot of authority. Let's take, a, I, I like to speak on the basis of practical examples, because when you try to speak in general terms, then finally you find yourself in, in, in a blind alley and, and thinking of an exception. So let's think of, of an example, uh, one that, that may resonate with, well, certainly with you, Fred, but, 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 but with our friends who are listening to us, Aida. Um, when Verdi composed Aida, uh, it is a fairly straightforward opera. He made some changes uh, fairly late in the game. He tried out an overture, an orchestral overture, a symphonia, which then uh, he decided not to use. We still have the music. Uh, but uh, um, uh, Verdi had some difficulties composing what ended up being one of the finest parts of the opera, the beginning of Act 3, of Act three the Nile scene. Um, and uh, uh, that part of the opera began very differently uh, originally with, with a chorus in, in the Palestrina style, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, Verdi didn't like it. He rejected it. And he rewrote the thing from scratch. And, and it is the masterpiece we all know and love. But he kept the music of mm -hmm. that original draft uh, of that. It's not, not a draft. It's a, actually a complete piece of music. He kept it in among the materials um, in, in his villa at Sant'Agata, which have recently become accessible to, to, to scholars. And uh, um, uh, my colleague and, and friend Anselm Gerhardt uh, found the, 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 um, uh, the first version of the beginning of Act Three uh, among, uh, among Verdi's papers at Sant'Agata, just, just two or three years ago. Um, he found those materials, he edited them, he wrote a wonderful article about them, and all of this is fantastic. Then at La Scala, Ricardo Chailly decided to 
produce an AIDA, to perform an AIDA, in which the beginning of Act Three uh, was replaced, uh, thus allowing an audience to hear Verdi's original music. I think that hearing Verdi's original music is very uh, important and uh, compelling, fascinating. I think, however, that it is an error. I disagree with Chagy's choice to, to put in uh, that piece in a performance of the whole opera, because Verdi himself rejected it very outright, outrightly. He was not happy about it, so he rewrote it. And in that case, uh, that's that's fine. Like with La Traviata, I, I, I mentioned a moment ago, I think we should perform La Traviata in its entirety as Verdi left, in, left it in 1854. I think that we can take the materials from 1853 and do concerts with them. That's my yeah. basic approach. But uh, sometimes I'm hard pressed uh, with, with operas for which Verdi created a new version without actually rejecting the previous one. Think of Simon Bocanegra, Verdi had mixed feelings about, uh, about the 1857 version. And when Ricordi sent him the score, uh, trying to encourage him to work on it again for what became the, the second version of the opera on which he worked with, uh, with Arrigo Poito for the first time, Ricordi initially, Verdi initially responded to Ricordi and said, oh, I've received the package from you. I think it might contain the, uh, the, the manuscript of, of Simon Bocanegra, but I haven't even opened it because I will not change a note. <laughs> now, Verdi was quite vehement. He was very you know, man of, of, of instinct. And also people in those days wrote letters with the same ease uh, and, and in the same moody manner that we now write, I don't know, WhatsApp messages. So um, uh, that, that kind of response shouldn't give us too much pause, but it should give us a little bit of pause because Verdi was not unhappy with the first Simon Bocanegra. Just like the first Macbeth is a very powerful work. Verdi yeah. felt that in 1865, in the reality of 1865, in the reality of Paris, he needed to make some changes. And then he felt that those changes would be great also in Italy. But as a matter of fact, Macbeth, even after the second version of 1865, continued to be performed during Verdi's lifetime in its first version. And Verdi did not take big issue. Uh, with uh, uh, with that choice. So I think that it's great that we have two Macbeths and that we get to hear both. I don't like to do to do um, mix and match. I don't like to to to, to take the death scene of of uh, Macbeth and put it into the 1865 version. Just like I don't like to uh, to mess around with Act Three of La Forza del Destino. I think that Act Three of La Forza del Destino is better as theater is better in its first version, but I also think that Act 4 of La Forza del Destino is much more powerful in its final version. Yeah. So what do we do? <laughs> uh, I think that it's great that we have both, and I know that that, that uh, James Levine conducted La Forza del Destino, and he did, of course, the, the, the final version, the 1869 version, uh, but I wish he had done the other one as well, and I'm glad there are people who do the 1862 version, like, for example, uh, our friend Victor De Renzi did in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. So I hope um, that this answers your question a little bit. It um, does, I, and you know, obviously, it's kind of like um, my favorite fruit are cherries, and when you eat cherries in Italian, you say una tira l'altra. In other words, yeah. you eat one, you have to have another one. When I talk to you, you plant the seeds for more questions in my head. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like well, the next cherry in the row. Um, I think that the craziest experience that Verdi must have had with censors was not uh, La Traviata or Rigoletto or Ballo and Moscola, but his little known opera, Giovanna d'Arco. And <laughs> about 12 years ago, I had to teach Giovanna d'Arco and People don't really teach it. They don't stage it very much. And I came across the Vatican censors version of the opera. And I'm forgetting now the what they renamed Giovanna. But she was moved from France to the island of Lesbos. And her father yeah, was and, and called Orietta di Lesbo. Orietta, Orietta di Lesbo. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so have you ever seen a production of Orietta de Lesbos, in other words, the Roman censor's version of Verdi's Giovanna d'Arco, which is about Joan of Arc? 
I have not. I have the libretto. I don't think that uh, that uh, Orieta di Lesbo uh, has been performed uh, as such in uh, in modern times. And uh, um, it is an interesting case, and I'm glad you're mentioning it. Um, I'd like to take a, just a quick and short step back uh, because there are two levels at which a composer and and uh, man of the theater can have problems with the censorship, uh, with with the censors in in Risorgimento, Italy. One is at the stage of the genesis and first performance of an opera. That is when a libretto is being shaped. So the, the, the story is chosen, the setting is chosen, the, the names of the characters and the, 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 the actual words that are sung uh, are chosen and the censors intervene to block, to alter, uh, to, to, to do their job, which is to censor uh, the text and turn it into something that is performable according to the dom dominant views of, of a ruling class. Then after that happens, a work of art is out there and it can be censored in when it goes to a different city, uh, when it is performed under a different set of circumstances. And this is what happens with Giovanna d'Arco. Uh, Giovanna d'Arco actually was censored. In particular, there are some interesting references to the Virgin Mary, uh, which are changed before the premiere of the opera. And thanks to the work of, of uh, the critical edition um, by, by Alberto Rizzuti, um, um, we can now perform the opera with the words that Verdi and Solera intended and not with the words that were forced upon them by the censors. But then Orieta di Lesbo uh, happened in, in another uh, context in, in the papal states. And, uh, and at that point, Verdi was very philosophical about that. He knew that he had very little control, let's say. Not, not no control, but very little control over what happened to his operas once they left his jurisdiction, meaning once they left his music stand and ended up in the hands of other performances, uh, other performers and uh, um, uh, subject to the pressure of other uh, political realities and authorities. Um, so in the case of an opera with, for, for, for which Verdi himself prepared a different version, we may want to perform it nowadays. I think that Orieta di Lesbo is fine where, where it sits, which is on, on, uh, on library shelves for, for nerds. I want to hear a For nerds like you and me to study. <laughs> I, at least in concert, I want to hear a performance of Orieta di Lesbo. Uh, well, let's do it then. I mean, yeah, I definitely. You know, whether a student production or something, or maybe a one night thing at the Verdi Festival in Parma or in Sarasota. Um, because, you know, do it after a performance of Giovanna D'Arco and just to have an understanding of how similar or different they could be, because the story is rewritten by Vatican censors is preposterous, even by the standards of opera. But the story of Joan of Arc, whether it's by Verdi or Tchaikovsky or someone else, is very compelling. It's mm -hmm. a great operatic story. Yeah. And this is not Verdi's greatest opera, but I think he understood the dramatic potential for that. Definitely. And, and Orieta di Lesbo completely throws that out the window. And it's I mean, the story is like a parody of opera. It makes Il Trovatore seem serious. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and you know, if, if you're into this, I, I, I'm sure you know them already, but I'll just bring up for, for those of us who are listening and, and who may be curious now about censorship. If you can read Italian, you really shouldn't miss out on the opportunity to read for the censored libretto of La Traviata called Violetta. Uh, uh, where, where you know the whole story of uh, of uh, of a fallen woman, of of a courtesan or a demi mundane, is completely altered, so that there is no sense that that Violetta uh, was was uh, um, uh, was a prostitute. Uh, and then you might want to look at Batilde di Turenna, which is one of the forms in which uh, the Vepra Sicilienne circulated in, in Italy prior to the unification. And then you might want to look at Guglielmo Vellingrode, which which is one of several <laughs> pedestrian attempts at recasting the story of Fidelio. Oh, sorry, not of Fidelio, of Stifelio. Stifelio. I always pick those two uh, up. Of course, Fidelio is a wonderful opera by Beethoven. I mean, Stifelio by Verdi, which was recast as Guglielmo Vellingrode. Our former friend, uh, you know, the, the late Martin Chusid, uh, mm -hmm. wrote a great article about the censorship of Rigoletto. Oh, there is a Clara di Perth, Clara di Perth, uh, which is a remake of, of Rigoletto, 
where if I don't, if I'm not confused, uh, actually Gilda survives the stabbing. Um, so there is a- So Clarity an, Perth would be Scotland, not Australia. Uh, yeah, I would assume so, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this month, the next edition of the Verdi Festival begins. And I know all of you are in preparation now for that. Uh, it's a wonderful experience to go to Parma in late summer, early autumn, and attend Verdi performances. What do you have this season? We have um, a program that includes um, staged productions of Il Lombardi alla Prima Crociata and Il Trovatore. So two very different operas for the fact that Lee Lombardi is, is not frequently performed, whereas Il Trovatore is one of Verdi's most beloved works. We are also doing a concert performance of Nabucco uh, in the Opera House in, uh, um, uh, in Fidenza. And uh, finally, last but not least, we're doing a... Um, um, uh, we're doing a Falstaff with uh, uh, with with a reduced orchestration, actually an arranged orchestration by a very talented young uh, composer and conductor, Alessandro Palumbo, in the Opera House in Buseto. We are also doing, as we have been doing every year since the uh, since the pandemic, we are doing uh, Verdi's uh, Requiem, uh, which is this year conducted by uh, by the Ukrainian con uh, conductor uh, Oksana Linif. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's start with the Little Opera House in Busseto. It has 368 seats, if I remember. And they opened it with Rigoletto. Verdi was rather diffident about that theater and about being honored by the town, even though in front of it is the most enormous statue of a seated Verdi with his head down deep in thought. Um, he let them open the theater, obviously. It's called the Tatra Verdi. It's a very small stage. It's a very charming little theater. Uh, the sight lines for much of the theater are not very good. But if you happen to be in the stalls, the platea, the, the downstairs, the orchestra, there are some good sight lines. But people should know that what looks like an aisle seat is actually a fold-down seat and is profoundly uncomfortable. So <laughs> you have to do a lot of planning when you go to that theater. But they squeezed in 368 people. But it is remarkable. I, I saw an Aida there many, many years ago with Daniela De C and Fabio Mediato, staged by Zeffirelli with a, a triumphal scene of 32 people, which is nothing for Zeffirelli. And it worked beautifully. And yes. I've seen fall staff in that theater. I've seen many things in that theater. And I do love going there. But it's a very different experience than the Grand Tatra Reggio in Parma. And I don't know the Opera House in Fidenza. Fidenza is sort of up the autostrada a bit toward Piacenza. Fidenza is famous in all of Italy or that part of Italy because it has a big outdoor outlet mall where people come from everywhere to buy Armani and fashion and so on. And but Fidenza has good food. It's a nice town. But why are you performing in Fidenza? We're performing in Fidenza because of Festival Verdi is, you know, of course, rooted in uh, in uh, in Parma, uh, and it is run by by the the uh, the Parma Opera House, the Teatro Reggio, which is let's let's say the parent company, <laughs> to use a horrible mm -hmm. corporate uh, term. Uh, but um, we are, I say we, uh, I'm not the person who makes these decisions, but I'm part of, the, of, of uh, the, the, the team and the community and I'm passionate about it. Uh, we feel that it is important to reach out and to open the doors of these wonderful historic opera houses around this region. So right now it is Buseto and Fidenza. It may be other places as well in, uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the opera house in Fidenza is also a 19th century opera house, slightly larger than the one in Buseto, but not substantially different. So we're still talking about less than half uh, the size of, uh, uh, of the Teatro Regio, which seats um, a, little, a little bit over uh, a thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, just like you, I have wonderful memories of being in, uh, in Buseto. Yes, the seats can be a little bit uncomfortable, although <laughs> they've been, I'm not sure whether it's me whether I have adjusted to them somehow, or whether they made some improvements, um, um, especially during during the pandemic when the theater was closed, but they felt a little bit softer than before uh, okay. when when I returned to 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 the, to the theater last year for the first time in three years. 
And uh, uh, it's a give and take, you know, it's very difficult to fit in a full size orchestra in there. In the 19th century, of course, they used you know, fewer string instruments and, uh, and they could do that. Nowadays, we need to make choices when we use an, an opera house like that, but we can still do Verdi's full orchestras um, uh, with, again, fewer instruments, but all the parts. And um, the trade-off is that you, if you have a good, good view of the stage, uh, you get to see facial expressions in a way that we may be accustomed to nowadays because of all of the, 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 the video recordings, the, the, the live broadcasts and the streamings and so on. Uh, but if you are in the reality of an opera house, being in such a small space is really very compelling. And um, acoustically, um, I'm not going to say that the acoustics are very good. Uh, they, they, they're probably not, and they're certainly not very good in Fidenza, but they are good enough. And what you, what I experience as an Italian and as a, some, someone who speaks Italian is that the words are much easier to understand while they're being sung compared to a larger opera house where the resonance is completely different. Uh, so there is, there is a lot to be said for the experience of going to these opera houses um, on, on a social yeah. level, on, on the level of experiencing the beauty of, his, of these historical theaters beyond the magnificent Teatro Reggio, but also the, 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 uh, the, the, the viewing and listening experience is quite different and uh, very enriching. Now, as we're winding up, I want to know that uh, I want you to know that listeners will be able to access the suggestions you gave on Adagio. Um, you have two arias from I Lombardi. You have two arias, Mil Trovatore, with uh, mostly modern singers, except Giuseppe De Luca, who was famous for his smooth, elegant baritone style, in Il Trovatore from another time. But I want to ask you specifically about an aria that you picked, uh, Quando le sed el placido, which many tenors say is the greatest Verdi tenor aria. I don't know, but it's a great aria from Louisa Miller. And like, like we don't have to choose, you know, we can like no. all of them. <laughs> but many tenors I talk to say that's the one they like the most from Verdi. Um, that and Una Fortiva Lagrima from Donizetti are the two they like the most. And you chose Alessandro Bonci, who had to go and look up a bit. He lived from 1870 to 1940. Um, it, why did you choose this interpretation of that aria when you could have chosen anyone? Bergoni, I chose it. I chose it uh, yeah. because because uh, um, partly because I, I trust our wonderful listeners to be able to do their homework, and I know for a fact that precisely because it's such a beloved Verdi aria, they will be familiar with some very wonderful performances by a number of singers, ranging from Carlo Bergonzi uh, to, uh, to Placido Domingo and Luciano Pavarotti and you name it. But not everyone will be familiar with, with Alessandro Bonci, who is still a bel canto singer and whose style, uh, the way he um, sings very softly at times, the way in which he emphasizes the diction of the words, the way in which he inflects the tempo, all of this give us a glimpse into Verdian singing at the time that Verdi was actually alive. Mm. Uh, we've shifted away from that considerably. Um, when, uh, um, when we performed Verdi, say 50, 60, 70 years ago in the middle part of the 20th century, the uh, aesthetic premises were much closer to the, the, to, to, to verismo, to a, a way, a style of singing that developed during the first half of the 20th century after Verdi had died. And uh, for me, it is very important to realize that Verdi, I guess we're going back to, to one of the things we said earlier on, that the opera is a very collaborative art form and that Verdi didn't live in a vacuum and he became who he was through his connection with an opera world that was already so rich. Um, and uh, um, there is, sometimes we talk about Italian opera of the 19th century and we say, oh, there is bel canto and then there is Verdi. And that is okay if we say that there is Lucia di Lammermoor and then there is Otello. But if we say that there is Lucia di Lammermoor and then there is uh, Il Lombardi alla prima crociata to mention one of the operas that we're preparing for this year's Festival Verdi, uh, that, that leaves me perplexed because when, Doniz when Verdi composed Il Lombardi alla prima crociata, Donizetti was still alive. Don Pasquale had been premiered only a few months before 
i, i, i Lombardi. And there is a lot of bel canto in Verdi at that stage, and still in operas like, yes, Luisa Miller, but also um, uh, La Traviata and Il Trovatore, maybe a little bit less so in, in Rigoletto, but there is bel canto, there is a reliance on the human voice as the main channel for the expression of the music, of the stories, of, of the depiction of the characters in, in these operas. And there is an expectation that singers will sometimes um, stick to the letter of what is written, but at specific times, based on a set of conventions uh, that, 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 that existed at the time, will also depart from what is written and change a cadenza or add an embellishment. Uh, or add a puntatura, meaning replace a note for, for a higher or lower note. Uh, all of this is very much in, in, uh, in the tradition of bel canto to which Verdi belonged. So when you listen to Alessandro Bonci sing Quando le sere al placido, I feel that you get a glimpse of that world mm -hmm. where the, it, it, singing is much more nuanced. And I don't mean this as criticism of any of the great Verdian singers who have existed and still exist today, many of whom are actually uh, people um, both of you and I know and have worked with, uh, um, and uh, many of whom are actually very interested in, in digging out uh, the, the, the essence of Verdi and Bel Canto, especially from the early operas. But I'm saying that uh, uh, Verdian singing uh, doesn't have to be all about, about uh, um, impulse and passion and power and vehemence, but can actually be very refined and very sophisticated uh, and, and, uh, and psychologically deep. This is the message that I hope uh, comes across when, uh, when people listen to Alessandro Bonci sing Quando le sere al placido. And I suppose that De Luca's Il Balen del suo sorriso uh, is, is, belongs in the same category of a singer who had this incredible flexibility uh, in the voice and the ability to sustain a note and sing it loudly and then make it softer and so on. Not what we expect today necessarily, mm -hmm. but, but very close to what Verdi expected. Yeah, final question. Would you give us an update, of the, if possible, about the state of Verdi's home in Sant'Agata, the farm that is so much debated about, will it become, will it be sold? Will it go to the state? What happens to the furniture? What happens to the scores and the documents that are within the estate? It's a very complicated story, but if you can give us an update, that would be great. I see that Francesco's Zoom has frozen. Let's see what happens. Maybe we'll have to get that answer at a future point. I'm checking with my engineer. It's just him, my engineer in Berlin tells me. Okay. Um, Francesco, are you back? Yes, I am back. I'm sorry okay. again. That's again. right. Did you hear the question? I heard the question. Okay. Uh, you, you, well, you're asking about the, the villa at Sant'Agata that was yes. really main a main residence for half a century. They lived there it was since Rigoletto. Yeah, until she until she died in in, in 1897, and then and then beyond. Um, this property was in the hands of Verdi heirs, and then there was a very complicated story of 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 inheritance. Uh, ultimately, the villa is now up for sale. The Italian state has the, 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 the option, you know, the right of first refusal. Uh, so uh, it is very possible um, that, uh, that it will be bought and that it will be in public hands, uh, or it may end up in private hands. Um, you asked me, first of all, to comment about the contents of the villa and, in particular, uh, via these manuscript materials, which belong in two broad categories. One is the music mostly sketches, preliminary versions, rejected uh, passages, uh, such as the opening of Act 3 of Aida, which I mentioned before. We don't need to be worried about those materials because those have been transferred to the Archivio di Stato, the state. Archive in Parma, I think he's saying, frozen again. The question is the future of the site itself. 
The big question is what happens to the villa with all it contains in terms of, of uh, furnishings, works of art, the garden. Uh, this is property that is very expensive to, 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 uh, to maintain. Uh, over the, the, the decades, uh, the, 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 the Verdi family ran a museum of sorts with guided visits to part of, uh, of the villa uh, so that people got to see the room where Verdi's worked and the piano and the, the, furniture, the furniture of the room where Verdi died in, uh, in the Grand Hotel in, uh, uh, in Milan and so on and so forth, you know, memorabilia of all kinds. What happens to Villa Verdi is what really uh, should uh, should be um, meaningful to us, because will it be again a museum where people go and see the place and take pictures and go away? Will it be modernized? Will it be run in a way that is more interactive, more accessible uh, to uh, to today's uh, visitors of different backgrounds uh, with uh, a different different uh, um, uh, physical conditions? Uh, will it really be a, uh, a, a, a 21st century institution? And will it be used as a cultural center? Um, as you know, it, this is not only a very um, a beautiful site that is very new moving to visit where you, know, you can breathe the air that Verdi himself breathed for, for decades, uh, but it is also a uh, very attractive location. Uh, and uh, it is a place where you could host conferences or run seminars uh, or, or you know, even organize residencies and so on. So I think that the, the real challenge, uh, hoping, as, as I do, that, uh, that the villa will remain in public ownership, uh, the real challenge is uh, to direct it and to organize a, uh, not only a wonderful site that people can continue to visit, uh, so that they, they have that additional way of honoring the, 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 the great composer's uh, life and, and work and memory. The big question is what happens there on a daily basis? And on this, we really, we really cannot comment yet because we don't know. I think in conclusion, I think that one more thing is that it's not just a site for music and for a great man. It's a site for um, agriculture and for plants. He imported all kinds of plants to Italy, to his grounds that had not been in Italy before. And until recently, you were able to go there and buy honey that was made by bees that fed on the plants that Verdi imported. I think that they need to expand their honey business and require that everybody buy a jar of honey as part I of the that's a great idea. I, there. I'm and, very partial to, to honey, so that your suggestion makes yeah. me very happy. And I but have, I, that, um, I have uh, apiculturista so, friends in Italy, and I would, I would recommend. I'm serious about this, that Verdi's honey, based on the plants that he imported and cultivated himself, that are still there, many trees, um, become part of the equation. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree, and I think that that there is what you're saying, Fred, is very profound. I, I agree completely. Not only because I'm partially I'm partial to honey, which is true, but also because uh, one of the challenges nowadays in museums around the world is to to shift away from the great man narrative. Uh, you know, it's so easy to tell the story of the great Verdi who sang, the, 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 who gave a voice to the Italian people um, uh, struggling uh, against foreign oppressors and, and uh, seeking unification and independence, not just a self-made man who was a genius and uh, who didn't learn anything from anyone because he already knew it all. Uh, but actually, we can, we can look at a place like Sant'Agata as belonging very much in uh, in. Uh, uh, mid to late 19th century culture and indeed agriculture. So I think that that what you're suggesting uh, is, is that Villa Verdi is important not only because it is where Verdi lived and the, the property that he developed and the, that he cared for and that he invested a lot of time on uh, and energy and financial resources, uh, but, but it is really you know, a casa patronale uh, where, which is surrounded by, by, um, uh, by farms and farmland uh, mm -hmm. and a very unique um, environment just very close to, to, to the river, the river Po. Uh, so all of that can actually play into making Sant'Agata uh, and the Villa Verdi an even more compelling place to visit. 
uh, to the point that even if you don't love opera and even if you don't know much about Verdi, perhaps you will be interested in visiting the place and who knows, by visiting it, you may get some exposure uh, to the man who lived there for so many years and whom you and I love and want other people to love too. So um, I, my brain is filled with all kinds of arcana and there's a lot of room in there for details for things. I suddenly cannot remember the name of the patron saint of Milan on December 7th when they opened Las Calas. San... Sant'Ambrogio. Sant'Ambrogio. Okay, Saint thank you. Sant'Ambrogio. So, um, he was named Ambrogio, Ambrose, because of his ambrosial speaking voice, and it relates to honey. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, there's something that we can link into this thing about we can have Francesco Melli the the, the tenor. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful well to, to add another layer wise, honey. <laughs> to add another layer to this you know let's, yeah. let's bear in mind that the first scene of you know Bardi alla prima crociata which we're preparing to do is is set in the church of Sant'Ambrogio in Milan that's right <laughs> all right good i think i'm you know it sounds like we're joking we're really not i think no, that you and i are demonstrating for our listeners is an incredibly deep passion and devotion to this wonderful man. And I think that people of you know already, but I think people have come to understand why he's my hero. Um, and I am guessing he's one of your heroes too. He um, certainly is, absolutely. I, but, I, I completely buy your words, Fred. You said at the beginning, he's one of your favorite composers. It doesn't matter whether he's your favorite, but he's your hero. And I feel the same way. Yeah, I love him. I didn't start as a Verdian, and I work on Verdi more than anything else in life at this stage. Uh, there, yep. there are a lot of other things I'm passionate about, but is he a hero for me? Yes. As a man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so whenever I conclude conversations about my hero, we always conclude with Viva Verdi. And so, Francesco, thank you for everything you do to bring him to the world because you do it so well. And well, thank you. Thank you for, for all you do to, to, to bring people closer to, to, to Verdi and to, to our music and opera in general. And Viva Verdi, indeed. And food. <laughs> <laughs> and food, absolutely. And prosciutto and pasta. <laughs> I'm not as, much, as, not as much as an authority uh, of an authority as you are on, on food, but I am very passionate about it as well. But they really do go together. Absolutely. And when I travel, and you know, wherever it is, I've been to Bayreuth. We haven't mentioned Mr. Wagner, but I'm I'm a Wagnerite too. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, not, he's not my hero, but his music and his operas and his ideas are fascinating, compelling. And to understand Verdi, we need to understand Wagner and vice versa. They don't, they're of a pair in a way it's the two titans of 19th century european opera and culture but um you know i always study what wagner ate and what mm -hmm. rossini ate and what mozart ate and beethoven and all the composers because it reflects their taste their nutrition their focus their seriousness you know rossini knew food he knew ingredients but he was indulgent in everything fattening and rich verdi mm -hmm. was a lot more discerning yeah. a lot more and bellini you know okay he ate good sicilian food but he was it was that was not what he was about and donizetti in a different way but donizetti is a very tragic story puccini game he would shoot the food that he wanted to eat i don't like the notion of always going out to shoot your food which is what he did or capture mm -hmm. your food from the lake but part of the adventure for Puccini was actually securing the food himself. Mm -hmm. Whereas Verdi would raise the food and supervise the health and well-being of the animals or the, the plants or whatever. That was a different level of attention and understanding that came from his own family of growing up, knowing about the land, the terra, the soil. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and, uh, you know, it's all of a piece there. And, and the fact that he knew that in a way that the others were, you know, people like to eat is different from what Verity was. And, you know, the land where that gave birth to him is the land that he cultivated and protected. And um, so he's my hero. Yep. <laughs> so, gracias, carissimo. Viva Grazie a te, Grazie a te, Fred. It's been and such a pleasure to see you, and and I hope that you manage to visit us in Parma very soon. I would love to, and have a wonderful festival, and say hello to everyone I know there.
I certainly will. I know that you you will be missed if you're not here. Not this year, but I do. I will be back. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ciao. Okay. Looking forward to it. Ciao.